With degrees in criminal justice and ethics, over 30 years of investigative experience, a recognized expert in investigation procedures, and an expert in criminal and social behaviors, I am Rick Decker, and this is A Shadow of Truth. Greetings from sunny Charleston, South Carolina. This is Rick Decker. So, what causes that proverbial snap? I mean, it's the verbiage we all use indicating that an individual has been stepped on their last nerve or went postal or snapped that last twig. Some people call it a psychosis. Others say it's related to environment and circumstances. So what causes us to kill? Today, we're going to look at that in Dylan Roof. Like when we looked at Dahmer, we found that he wasn't really crazy. It was just he was antisocial. Mass shootings and single killings and serial killings all start somewhere, usually in the abyss of someone's mind. And the question is, is what causes those individuals to decide to go against societal constructs of do no harm into creating chaos? All too often, we hear that killers have an ideology they subscribe to. Then we hear it's an issue of sanity or some type of disorder that causes the behavior that caused the crime. As humans, we need to define what we don't understand so that we can comprehend. Freud said once that we all try to relate death of another person to just being a chance event. Although it is unavoidable and everybody experiences death. Even when we think about our own death, we put ourselves as a third-party person and try to see it as another person because our psyche really just simply can't handle it. Ergo, we try to blame something or someone else for what we cannot understand. So the topic today is what causes us to kill there. Truth of the matter is there's a variety of reasons. Um, to look at those concepts, we're going to look at what I think is one of the most irrational killings in the Charleston area, and that's Dylan Roof. You know, we have to ask what caused Dylan to gun down people in church, people that he really had no connection to. In general, scholars, pseudo-scholars, generally almost everybody, we tend to blame either mental illness or some type of an addiction as the generic catch-all to explain these behaviors. Even experts fail to properly identify violent behaviors. We tend to focus on one perpetrator at a time, and all too often we categorize these reasons for murder like we're trying to determine what type of flu we have so we can go get the accurate cold medicine from the local store. For the most part, the general people, public, when we hear that somebody is killed, we say, oh, you know, hell, they must have been angry or resentful. But these descriptors tend to address reasons why people kill with a lot of ambiguity. So today we're going to talk about Dylan Roof. He was born and resided near Columbia, South Carolina. His dad was a carpenter. His name was Frederick. Mom was Amy, and she was a bartender. The, the marriage was strained, estranged to say the least. I mean, Frederick eventually married another woman. The family dynamic wasn't much different than many families that we see today. However, why did he do what he did? did. Now, he had some siblings. Morgan was a sister. She's been out of trouble. And since rec the last account as of today and of this recording, um, they really don't know where Morgan is. So Dylan, Dylan walked into Emmanuel AME Church, downtown Charleston, and shot nine people to death each of them African-American, people gathering in a house of worship, people that did this thing in safety on a regular day-to-day -day basis. 
I don't want to make the show all about Dylan, but we are looking at why this man did these these things. And I don't want to refer to the people that he killed as victims because that denies that label denies them their identity. So I want to call these people out by name because I want you to remember their names and I want you to remember why he killed these people. Pastor Pickney, Myra Thompson, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, DePayne Middleton Doctor, Daniel Simmons, Cynthia Hurd, Ethel Chance, Susie Jackson, and Tawanza Sanders. The only issue as to why he killed these individuals was that they were people of color. You know, in the last episode, we talked about Kyle Rittenhouse and all the allegations of the militia being supposedly related to white supremacist crime or white supremacist groups. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, this this event that Dylan Roof did, this is what neo-Nazi white supremacy crime looks like. So if you had an unclear picture of what it really looked like, now you know what real hate crime and white supremacist activity looks like. Now, Dylan had, for some reason, decided to develop a dislike a hate, a dissension for people of color. He frequently told his neighbors that, and and those he knew, his friends, that the blacks were trying to take over and, and needed to be stopped. Now, this is the common mentality of these white supremacist groups. In fact, he had planned on attacking the College of Charleston. He had told people for years, this is what he was going to do. But nobody took him seriously. And I'm like, what the hell? I mean, right? You tell people you're going to go attack a college and nobody pays attention because they didn't take you serious? So what triggered Dylan? According to my research, what apparently had tripped his trigger, pissed him off, were the events surrounding Trayvon Martin and the Baltimore protest, as well as the death of Freddie Gray during while he was in police custody. On many occasions, he told people that he supported segregation of the race and desired to start a civil war. Days after the shooting, he made several statements where he said he really was just trying to start a race war. His trigger, for whatever reason, was hate. Hate of people for no other reason than the color of their skin. Nothing more. And for the majority of us, that is no reason to kill somebody. That's no reason to hate somebody. But somebody like Roof, well, it was. So, as we all know, Dylan defended himself. Now, from a criminal investigator standpoint, I believe anytime somebody wants to defend themselves, they are calculating an inevitable end, which means they're setting themselves up for appealable issues because they know they're going to lose. They know they're, they're, they're screwed. And, Dylan was convicted and sentenced to death. Now, that falls right into what I just said because that sentence carries automatic appeals. These appeals can take years to mull through and you automatically are assigned an appellate lawyer. You cannot really generally represent yourself, although some people try, during appeals. Now, this appellate attorney, and rightfully so, they are obligated to fully defend the client. So they found cause based on the fact that Dylan represented himself 
saying that during the sentencing phase, Dylan denied jurors hearing important evidence concerning his mental health. Now, the reason why that happened is Roof stated somewhere along the line to somebody that he believed if he kept his mental issues out of public view, that the white nationalists would rescue him from prison. This assertion is not the first time in my career that I've, I've heard this, and I've heard it by um, people like Ken Peterson and other people that I had defended over the years um, for various drug crimes and stuff that um, had been found to be of the um, white supremacist orientation. And they always felt like the brotherhood would come save their ass. And more often than not, little guys like Dylan Roof trying to make their way into the the uh, good deeds or the good light of the white supremacist groups, even by those groups are seen as freaking crackpots and those groups really don't want anything to do with them either. And that says something, I mean, because the majority of us feel that white supremacist groups are really left field way out there whack jobs. Well, if the whack jobs think that you're a whack job, then you really have some problems, don't you? Anyway, according to the New York Times, um, New York Times reported that Dylan was evaluated for mental disorders. Now, like I said at the beginning of the show, when people kill, we tend to automatically jump to and blame mental Ill illness, which normally I don't have any problem with. However, in recent years, I'm seeing this catch-all being used that causes a false sense of classifying people with a particular disorder as being potentially violent and suspect to being killers when they really aren't. And so what he was diagnosed with was mixed substance abuse disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and depression by self-disclosure because of his personal history, all of which are commonly seen in diagnoses and assessments of people that commit heinous crimes. The problem I have, and we saw this in um, Dahmer, and I've seen it in, in other killers uh, recently, is that they also jump to this, con not conclusion, but they allude that these people, including Dylan, suffer from social anxiety disorder and autistic spectrum disorder. Now, for those of you that don't know, social anxiety and autism often go hand in hand. It's just the nature of the beast. So you need to understand that district attorneys, and we've talked about this before, stack charges to gain momentum for conviction. They do this so that you can't weasel out of, of, um, of charges and they have a higher conviction rate. That being said, psychiatrists who are court appointed also use the DSM-5, which is a di psychological diagnostic tool. Um, it's a book to stack disorders because, see, the more they claim is supposedly wrong with the client, the better, even if the diagnosis is not 100% accurate. So they'll use terms like suspected, seems to be, or appears. What this verbiage means is they're really not sure. That it's just, you know, what it looks like to them. So the issue that I have with this, like I said, is that when they start throwing in the anxiety, social anxiety and the autism disorders. We have a society that now is starting to assume that all people on the spectrum and all people that have social anxiety disorder 
are potential killers. And that's simply not true. I'm not a doctor, but I'm a doctor of philosophy. I'm not a medical doctor. And my job is to let people understand the impact that labeling and these things that happen have on our society, things that when professionals like lawyers and doctors start naming all this stuff off for public purview, we have a tendency as people that aren't in that profession to say, oh my God, all people with cognitive disorders are potentially violent. Now, I wrote an article for the um, Encyclopedia of Courts, Criminal Justice, and Law Enforcement a couple of years ago, and I wrote two of them. And one of the articles was on um, policing the mentally ill. And this has become so prevalent that a Florida man about the same age as my son is now was shot to death by a police officer because he wouldn't comply. And it turned out the guy was autistic and couldn't understand because he was in crisis on how to respond to the police officer. So all of this stuff that is reported on all these heinous crimes has a major negative impact on people in a regular society. All right, let me get back on track. I mean, I could go on for that for like another hour. So why do people kill? Well, truth be told is that motives vary. There is no real set concrete motive. Like Ruth, sometimes it's related to substance abuse coupled with intermittent explosive disorder, domestic violence or destructive family dynamics, or even just hate. And for others, it's a lifestyle dynamic, like living dangerously, uh, where people go to commit a crime and all of a sudden the victim gets shot by accident. All too often, people claim motives as the cause, which is a miscategorization. Motives are generally personal revenge, moral depravity, or even demonic possession, anarchism, like with Roof, most killers are remorseful. Those that are not really have some type of mental disruption caused by either nature or chemically induced. The act of killing each other is further confounded by political ideals and overzealous journalists gas grasping at straws to explain to a society, you know, political people jump on the bandwagon, a war on crime. Well, that's really not going to fix anything because, ladies and gentlemen, violence has always been a part of our existence. Murder has been around since Cain and Abel, and we are no more closer today in fully understanding why people kill than when God himself asked Cain, why did you kill your brother? What this all really boils down to is personal accountability. It's paramount in determining what happens to us as individuals and as a society. See, when one of us kill, even if it's somebody we didn't know, we didn't know the actor, we didn't know the victim, the impact is global because we're all human beings. I've said this before on other shows that we're, ladies and gentlemen, if this ship sinks, we all sink together because we're on the same damn boat. Um, So it has a global impact on all culture. All civil societies are horrified by murder. It is our responsibility to positively touch the lives of others, even if it is inconvenient. Events like Dylan Roof fortunately for our society, are rare. Although the type of mentality, however, is not. During my academic work, I did a a paper on white supremacist work based around the fact that I had 
um, defended Ken Peterson for drug charges, and Ken Peterson was the Grand Wizard. I talked about this in another show of the Ku Klux Klan that verged everybody together in Janesville, Wisconsin. And these people communicate through the dark web, and and luckily the majority of us do not see it. But there are events that happen that aren't fully reported and people are not told about the real story. A number of years ago, there was a bank robbery up in the Milwaukee area. Uh, a father and son were robbing a bank and they shot the officers and they were subsequently shot and killed on site. And the backstory to that is that they were robbing banks, gaining money, so that they could stock arms in their Wisconsin farm. And they were trying to gain the interest and get noticed by white supremacist groups because, damn it, they wanted to be part of the movement. And that was never really reported to, to people. And this stuff happens although not all the time, but it, you need to be aware of it. it. It does happen. Hate through our society is prevalent, and sadly, I, I think it's going to always be prevalent because people are biologically dysfunctional. Although Dylan was a spree killer and not a serial killer, I, I really think that he was disorganized, but he also fell into the mission-oriented typology. Uh, he thought it was his sole duty to get rid of a particular population, and unfortunately, that particular population were people of color. I'm not aware of you know, exactly what his psychosis was other than what was said in the New York Times. But I do know that he matched this vision, mission-orientated typology. Most mass killers, they do. They are on a mission. They have a purpose. We know today that our society is divided. It's being divided by groups who disagree and refuse to compromise. It's divided by politicians. You know, I believe as a scholar and just as a man that we have a job to do as individuals to leaving the world a better place than what we left it. In fact, I have a saying that I've published that I've been using for years that I've said I, when I leave this world, I want to leave it as a wide brush stroke and not as a number two pencil. And last night, I don't normally talk about this um, on the end of my personal life, but I was invited to go see a show last night in a genre that I don't normally listen to. My son wanted me to go to a rap concert. Now, my age group isn't typically the rap enthusiast you know so i saw my first rap concert last night and i have to tell you that the message that this young man this rapper perpetuated was one of positivity love and respect for each other despite each other's differences this man prayed for the entire crowd and as he was praying he singled people out telling them you in with the red hair and you over here you know something tells me that i have to speak to you and that i love you and that you are worthwhile his message for the entire crowd was inclusion acceptance forgiveness of others and of yourself telling them that letting people know that your past doesn't define you and he told about his past and now this 
was a regular rapper. This was not a per se Christian type rapper, but he talked about that how all his songs came from his inner soul to align his chakra and align his chi and his spirit. And as a behavioralist, I was sitting there thinking, you know, we have a society that is being destroyed by the actions of others and the news media. You have this young man up here talking to people of color, talking to men, women, white, old, young, and bringing them together with a message of love and responsibility for yourself and for others and to grasp onto humanity, to keep it together telling them that it was their responsibility and he felt it was his responsibility. Who am I talking about? Kevin Gates. Mr. Gates, I am talking about you. And I have to tell you, when I was at that show last night, it was refreshing. It was an honor to be there. And ladies and gentlemen, if you listen to that genre and you have an opportunity to go see this man, Go see him because his message for his fans is love and respect. And on that note, this is the show. Thank you for watching. Please, let's take care of one another. Until next time, carpe diem. <laughs>